what happens with finances, just like in your individual life, it's really a symptom of what's going on in your heart. So I think that the emotional and the mental separation starts first, and then it filters into every area of your marriage, including intimacy. To love fearlessly, today's segment is the 500th episode uploaded going on to YouTube. So this is really monumental to me. And I mean, I have a special guest that's coming on today that they're going to bless you tremendously because, you know, I like to discuss finances and stuff like that. So let's talk about today's guest. She is an entrepreneur. She's a TEDx speaker, author, and a main contributor at Principles of Increase. And uh, she'll give out her information at the end of the episode and a website that provides it's a principles of increase dot com. It's a website that provides useful tips and information around building family, faith and financial freedom. Brave Hearts community on this 500th episode. Let's welcome Azra McClanahan. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing well, Sean. Thanks for having me and congratulations on your 500th segment. That's a huge milestone. So kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we bring it in with a bang. Got to have a special <laughs> guest to celebrate this episode with me. Well, first of all, I found you on Twitter. We've been following each other for a while. Did some more research on you and stuff like that. I started watching the videos. I got hooked. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking I have to bring her on the show to discuss finances because this is something that I think we discuss in marriage, but at the same time, we really need to have these in-depth conversations about that. First of all, what inspired you, because you're an author, what inspired you to write the books, How How a Mother Should Talk About Money with Her Daughter? Yes. For those who are watching this on video. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just a little bit of background about me. I was an econ major in college and then got out of school and didn't know anything about money. I was in debt. I was broke, um, got married and figured out that I wanted to stay home with my kids. So when I was married at the time, um, the person I was married to, we kind of decided like, yeah, let's try to figure this out. So we went on this journey to become debt free, accomplished our goal, paid off all our finances. And I started a financial blog because so many people are like, well, how did you do that? How did you pay off all your debt? And then from there, I became a freelance writer on different financial topics like credit cards, mortgages, taxes, crypto, um, anything personal finance related. Uh, that's pretty much what I would cover. And then eventually I was approached by a book publisher who said, hey, we think that you we've seen some of your work on the internet and we would like you to write you know a book and you know kind of brainstorm some topics and and that's what I did so they wanted me to um do something that wasn't so general like just how to manage your finances so they really wanted me to niche down so I was like oh I already did this TED talk I think you know um that based on the TED talk that would it would make sense because I've already got material so just this idea of like what how money works like with women and relationships and your daughters and all this fun stuff. So I, I'm really pleased with how the book came out. Unfortunately, it launched during COVID. So I didn't do a lot of marketing and I was at the beginning of my divorce. So I'm hoping to be able to do like a relaunch and start promoting it and marketing it more. But I'm, I'm still really glad I did it and I'm glad at how it came out. Yes, for sure. Because I had to share it on Mother's Day. Oh. I hope that you're the one And that you are the prototype I know, oh my goodness My life has been a whirlwind And just, you know, kind of like a heads up you know, when I first started writing about personal finance content, I had a certain type of approach, you know, very formulaic, very down to the book. I was a huge spreadsheet nerd. And then my life basically got put in a blender in 20, starting in 2019. Of course, 2020 came and just all this stuff came crashing down on me. So I am still very much interested in making 
my goal to reach financial independence and manage my money well, but it just looks a little differently for me now. So I'm happy to just like talk about that transition and how, you know, how I'm working through that. Cause I'm like kind of back on the journey, like, like getting back on the wagon again. Um, but I'm still been incredibly blessed. So I'm really happy to share like how, how that unfolded and, and what's going on with that now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you also have a book, Manage Your Money to Become Debt Free. Yeah, so that was a book I self-published. And mm -hmm. gosh, it's pretty old now, but the principles still apply. It's maybe it's basically like if you're familiar with Dave Ramsey and the baby steps, that's what we use to get out of debt. And it's just kind of like a quick palatable form of that. And it just talks about making a spending plan, aka a budget increasing your income, cutting back, investing or saving the difference. So ba ba very basic principles of personal finance when it comes to getting out of debt and then taking in the next step into investing and eventually creating like a generational legacy. So it's a quick read. I think it's so helpful. I even have an audio book that goes along with it. I did the audio book. I did the voiceover. I'm so like proud of that. Um, so yeah, that's on Amazon as well. Awesome. Yeah, cause, because I have that on my wish list. So I want to make sure I get that because oh, I need you. to <laughs> listen to that in my audio version because uh, I want to talk about this next question with you about finances and is one of the top three reasons why marriage end. And what are your tips to help marriages strive in this area? So I think one of the, th I, I know there's this statistic that financial issues are one of the main reasons that marriages end. And I, I feel like having gone through what I went through, I feel like what happens with finances, just like in your individual life, it's really a symptom of what's going on in your heart. So I think that the emotional and the mental separation starts first. And then it filters into every area of your marriage, including intimacy, including your, your finances, including how you deal with the kids. I think there's just a level of supreme irritation all around. And one of the easiest ways to disconnect is like when you stop communicating, you're not talking about how you're reaching your financial goals. And I think it's just a symptom of something that's already there, but it, it's still aggravates you know already bad situation and it ultimately causes people to how do how do people avoid this so honestly i think you know maybe five years ago i would say have your budget meetings have a budget date night you know do your vision boards together and i think all that should happen but i think now that I know what I know, I think a better answer is to work on your connection, your emotional connection and how you communicate. That's what it is. Work on your communication. Because that's one, again, one of the first things to go when that communication break breakdown starts to happen. It just affects every other area. So I know the temptation is to be like, oh, we have a problem in our marriage. Let's go to a sex therapist. Let's go to of you know a financial counseling let's go to let's do all these things that are symptomatic of what's really the communication breakdown that's happening and just the, the break in intimacy and connection so i would say if you feel con you know work on your connection your intimacy your communication and from there you can have a shared vision right you can articulate a vision and I'm a huge fan of like writing the vision, making it plain. And when you have a vision, the vision will then tell you what to do. So the vision may say, okay, if you want to, you know, leave $10 million to charity when you pass away as a family, you know, when the, you know, um, as a family legacy or whatever. Um, if the vision says that and you're like living check to check, then you'll know the vision will be like, you actually need to, get some debt counseling or you need to enroll in Dave Ramsey's program or whatever flavor of, you know, financial therapy exists out there. So I'm, I, I, now that I know what I know, I would say go back to the root, which is connection to intimacy communication. Then you'll get a financial vision or just an overall vision. And that'll feed into like a financial vision, then a vision on how, you know, the godly legacy that you want to leave like with your kids and all those areas uh, that your marriage would impact in life. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it's more of a heart issue. 
when it oh, comes to absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because the reason why people end up fighting over finances is because I think it should be my way. He thinks it should be his way. And where does that come from? That comes from selfishness. And, and where does that come from? You're looking out for self. You're protecting self first. Because again, there's been that break in that connection and that intimacy, intimacy and communication network. Um, so yeah, when, whenever, I mean, there's this idea too that money doesn't make you a jerk. Money just makes you more of what you already are, right? And that's the same thing in marriage. Like if there's already a breakdown happening or a disconnection happening, money will just magnify that. It's not necessarily the cause. It's usually a symptom of a bigger problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because sometimes I wonder what does it takes for people to see that heart issue? You know, like, what is Ooh. it like? So I was wondering, because it's more of a, a heart posture in the way that we see finances. And a lot of it probably had to do with us growing up, right? Mm-hmm. Because I, I I was watching your video, your, uh, your TEDx talk, and you was talking about, you know, with grandma and how she was able to, like, take care of people based off of the little money that she made, you know. So, obviously, uh, her heart was probably in the right place because she managed the money. Yeah, she made very little money as long as I knew her. She just lived off of her um her, uh, she was a widow, so she lived off her husband's pension and I think Social Security. It was just, I mean, pennies basically. And she managed her money so well where she would, I mean, I, I remember stories where somebody be like complaining, a cousin or something like, oh, my tires in my car. And she could, she'd say, go, go down the Sears and they're going to put some new tires on the car. She had one of those Sears credit cards. And um And so she would just do, she would let people live with her all the time. And she, she helped me transparency. You know, I just want people to know, like she helped me when I was in college, she co-signed for my loan. She helped me make payments when I first got out of college. Um, She helped me, you know, pay on my first car. And I'm so, I'm just so grateful. I've had a lot of financial help in my life. So I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm just so smart. I have it all figured out because that was not the case. Eventually, I did get smarter and more sophisticated in my approach towards money. But in the beginning, by God's grace, I had a lot of help. I had a lot of supportive relatives, supportive relatives, like my mom lived with her on and off throughout uh, my marriage, you know, back and forth. Actually, you know, I was just living with her in Chicago, came to Florida, and now she's living with me. So I've been really blessed um, to have like this support network in my life. But I also will say that I have friends who've been in similar positions, but because their focus wasn't on money or, you know, just different things going, a different mindset, a different money mindset, they would have similar offers and they'd be like, I could never go back home or I can't live. I would never take a, one, of, one of my claims to fame is I moved to the hood to get out of debt free, to get out of debt, to, to pay off all of our debt. We took a house in the inner city of Chicago, had bullet holes in the back door, and um, it was mortgage free. All we had to do was clean it up and, you know, fix it up and move in. And uh, it was very scary because we were from the suburbs. Um, This is when I was married and we had this offer like, hey, you want this house because a relative inherited a house they didn't want. And they were like, I don't want to live in the hood. And we were like, neither do we. But then we were like, wait, we're broke. You know, but I've had other friends who had the exact same offer and either they didn't want to spend the money to fix up the place. They didn't want to live in the hood. They didn't want to be bothered with the paperwork or whatever the case was. So, yes, I have had a lot of support, but I don't think I'm unique. Like each one of us have, has been given either a special gift or support network or something. It's just when you get your money mindset in order, you'll be able to perceive the opportunities that can help you advance financially. Because what you did was something that a lot of people isn't willing to do. They aren't willing to sacrifice their lifestyle. You know, they want to make sure that they look good, you know, but you took the necessary steps. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely, it was hard because in my mind, I was going to graduate college, 
get this posh job, be driving these nice cars, live, you know, I had this whole vision of how my life was going to be. But then I, I started having kids and I knew I could not take them to daycare. I knew I wanted to stay home with my kids and everything went out the window. I was like, Lord, you know, I want to be home. I want to teach my kids. I want to be home with them and whatever I have to do to make that happen. If I have to move to the hood, you know, and drive this old car, I will do that. And again, by his grace, it was not a bad experience. Like we end up getting a really nice, a couple of nice cars um, because we didn't have a mortgage. um, And then we were to pay pay off our debt. And then I was able to stay home with my kids and they got involved in acting and entertainment. So Chicago is a big town for like um, national commercials. When you see like Walmart commercials and Target and stuff, a lot of times they'll film in Chicago. A lot of voiceover stuff happens in Chicago. So it's a great secondary entertainment market. It's not like LA or New York, but there is a lot of activity. And as a result, my kids actually made quite a bit of money because I was able to be at home with them and manage their careers, invest their money, put it in um, index funds and things like that. And then on top of that, we were able to travel. I mean, we had such a rich quality of life, even though we were like living in the hood. I would always be like, this is really the epitome of hood rich. Like we live in the hood, but we have a great quality of life. I I absolutely love my life there. I had great neighbors and there were people just like me. I thought I had done something special, but there were other, you know, families around our same age, same age kids. And they were like, this is the light. This is the hack. You live in the hood. Let the outside of your house look crazy if you have to. You come in. It's nice. You get to travel. We were by the airport. Um, and we just enjoyed everything the city had to offer. So it, I went into it thinking like, oh, my life is over. I'm going to be done with this in three to five years. But when it was all said and done, we stayed you know, well over 10 years. And I just ended up having like literally the time of my life. Um, so, and I would, I would still be there had I not gotten divorced and I, I had to move, you know, for some different reasons, but, um, you know, so I'm now I'm here, but it was just, it was a really precious experience. And I think just being able to surrender and say, Lord, I don't care how I look. I don't care what people think. Cause that people, my friends were making fun of me. My relatives were like, you crazy. Um, but I think making that sacrifice and doing that really, it just opened the door for us to be blessed, and it was a great experience. Mm-hmm. And, and when did when did the switch turn on? When did you understand how money work? Was there a specific time in your life when it all clicked and you said, "Oh, this is how how money works"? Can you take us honestly? Back to the <laughs> so honestly, I'm going to totally do a shameless plug of my pastor, Bill Winston, and. Mm-hmm. He's in Forest Park and he, I mean, he called it the prosperity gospel or whatever, but he was the first person I heard talking about, like, if you're a Christian, you should be financially able to do things in your community. Like, don't be out here complaining about police brutality, the failing school system, all this, you know, you should be able to, you know, pay to whatever, whatever, pay your political candidate that you want. The, the, You know, he was like, if you're a Christian, you should not be broke. You should be out of debt. All your needs should be met. And you should be able to advance kingdom agendas, especially in impoverished areas. And that just, I was like, wow. So, I mean, he would preach like you should have money, but it was like money with a purpose. And I don't get me wrong. He'd be like, you know, get your nice car, get your nice stuff too. But the purpose of wealth is to establish the covenant. And when I started hearing that, I was like, man, I want to be debt free. How do I do this? And so he was really high level, like, here's the scriptures, here's the, but then I met some people who were like, connected the bridge for me, like the practical to the spiritual. And they introduced me to Dave Ramsey. And I was like, what? And I'm, I I found him, like, they told me about him. And then I found out he had a radio show. This is way back in the day. This is like 18, 19 years ago. So I'm listening to him on AM radio. And I'm like, oh, that was a nice special that he had on the radio. And then I found out he had it every day. I'm like, this man talks about being debt free every single day. I was was like, this is so crazy. So I started listening to him. I got his books. And then I was looking at the plan. I'm reading how to do this and that. And I'm like, I think we can do this. I think we can do this. So I brought the plan to my then husband at the time. And he's like, okay, fine. And so I started managing all the money in the household, paying all the bills. 
And, you know, it, it took a while because we had some setbacks and some different things that happened. But maybe like seven, eight years, we were able to pay over $120,000 of um, just like consumer debt off cars, student loans, all that stuff. And it was just it was really so glorious. So I'm like, oh, my goodness, we actually did this. We actually became debt free. And then another thing is uh, we while I was married, I was able to bring two properties, you know, mortgage free properties into the into the relationship because I'm I'm at home all day. I got nothing but time. So, you know, I'm figuring out how to, you know, get stuff, deals and discounts. And that was just kind of like the story of what we did. We travel for free to cheap. We got you inexpensive real estate, started doing Airbnb and rentals and stuff. So it was really amazing like to see that unfold and see like, okay, this is what the scripture says. It was the Bible says you can do. And then we were able to take the steps and bridge the gap and, and do it. And, um, and so, yeah, that was something that happened for us. I forgot the question. I'm just rambling now, but, <laughs> but you know, the point is, um, Oh, you asked me, how did I figure out this thing about finances? And I will say that it's when I went to church and I heard a man preach, he was like, if you're a Christian, you should be debt free and you should have enough to support the kingdom. Mm. And that's how everything started for me. Mm. I, yeah, I love that because I still watch my old pastor back home in Ohio. And one thing I love about him, he always says, my wife and I live a life that's beyond us. Like we're past us. We're yeah. all about advancing the kingdom and about helping yeah. other people. Because too many times when you have financial issues, you only consumed with you and your spouse. You can't get outside the four walls of your house. Exactly. But exactly. We, and call that prosperity gospel, whatever. But, you know, that's I, I believe it's in the Bible. So, yeah, I no, I totally agree. So I always tell my wife and I'm like, I want us to live a life that's beyond us where we can help other people where we're good and we can help yeah. other people without missing a beat. I do have one more question that I would like to ask, especially with uh, the marriage piece, because this is a relationship show. Uh, but sure. <laughs> how did you and, and your ex-husband, how did y'all get on the same page when it came to finances? Because when I talk to couples, a lot of times, one of them is usually the spender, the other one is the saver. Like, how did y'all get on the same page to make that work? Honestly, we're both cheapskates. We're both. And well, I don't want to say that because that, that's not exactly true. Because I do. I like nice stuff, but not at the expense of my future well-being. So that I do like shopping. I like Louis Vuitton. I like fancy vacations. But I'm not going to do it to jeopardize um, my savings and all that stuff. So I think it worked out for us because we were on the same page. The person I was married to was very much um, a cheapskate. And and then I was just in vision mode. I'm like, okay, I want to be home with my kids, but I want to eventually have things. I want to invest in real estate. So that just came together where it made us where we were not big spenders. And because I stay, I was a stay-at-home mom during the whole um, relationship. So I was married for 17 years and being me being home, I was able to like really manage to a T all of our resources. So we, like I said, we lived, we were on like one and a half salaries and the person I was married to worked for the post office. So it wasn't like, you know, tons of money just rolling in. It was just, I had the time, I had internet access and I would just be figuring out how to find deals and discounts. And it, it just really worked out for us. And then, you know, the person I was married to also, you know, I think they also had a vision and they were also like, well, yeah, this is going to get us to like early retirement and we're going to be debt free. That's, it was kind of like a no brainer and he's a pretty laid back person anyway. And I think me being able to take the burden of the finances off of him, he's like, well, if you figure something out, then go ahead, you know? And so that, that just kind of worked like just, he's super, you know, I'm very ambitious, very, let me take over and do stuff. And he was like, well, all right, fine. And less, less for me to worry about. So it just worked out at the time. Mm -hmm. So do you think that most people, do you think most, do you think most couples should work the finances together or do you think someone should be in charge? 
Well, I would say in our situation, I, w- I wouldn't say that I was in charge because, you know, being a Christian, I still, I believe in the traditional roles. That's why I was a stay-at-home mom and I homeschool my kids. I believe in submission and respect and honoring a husband. And I, I, I do believe in all that. Call me old-fashioned, pick me, whatever, whatever the <laughs> new term is. So for me, I was more, I would say I was more like the manager, but I did run decisions by him. And there were times where he would be like, no, I don't want to do that. And I would be like, okay. And so I, I really worked very hard in my marriage to be like, Lord, help me to submit. Even when I feel, you know, maybe afraid he's going to make a bad decision or, uh, and there were times where I was like, I thought he was making a disastrous decision, but I was like, Lord, I trust you. And I'll, I'll give you an example. There was one time he, wanted to get a car and it was, it was an awful car. And I knew this thing was going to break down. And, and we had, we had, we were like almost through paying off our debt and we just barely had like maybe like $3,000 in the bank. And which was huge to me, that was like a million dollars, all the blood, sweat and tears. And I think I might've even been pregnant at the time with my second child. And he found this car on Craigslist and he's like, we need another car. And I'm like, this is going to, this is an awful car. So anyway, I was like, okay, Lord, I trust you. We got the car. And then two days into getting and having the car, what do you think happened? You already know. Transmission. Transmission goes out. We get a quote to fix it for like $1,200. And I'm like, oh my God. This, now this is all of our money. Uh, and, I, and I'm like, I know he's not going to try to fix this car. I know. And he's like, oh, let's go ahead and fix it. And I'm like, and it's a Pontiac. Of, okay, a Toyota, Honda. Okay, yeah, you can understand. It's a, like a Pontiac from 1990-something. I'm just like, this is the worst decision ever. So then, I said, like a good little wife, I said, okay, okay, Lord, I trust you. And so then we have this car, we get it fixed and everything. And it's still like having some problems. Not as bad, but it's just not just not ideal. And I'm just like, Lord, I got no money in the bank. We got this crappy car. I'm not driving that thing, but I trusted God. And then eventually, you know, maybe a couple of weeks into driving it, he tells me, he says, I don't think that's my car. And I said, Oh my goodness. So then we said, well, what are we going to do? You know, I, I don't know if we could sell that to somebody. It's really not that good. So we actually decided to give it to a family member to sow it as a seed to someone in our family and that's what we did and uh we were without a second car for a while and maybe like three months later a situation happened where I was I used to do like different like sales and marketing consulting work from home so I was working for a client and basically I got a a huge bonus and we were able to get another better car, totally debt free. We got like a Toyota Avalon, which I'm like, you know, I'm I'm bougie like that, the Toyotas. And so it worked out. But in the, but the point of this story is, is that I I knew everything bad that was going to happen. I was like, this is an awful idea, but because I believe in that hierarchy, you know, God, Christ, the husband, the wife, I was able to submit and be like, Lord, I trust you because I believe that's a place where you're protected. Even, and there's a scripture about this. I think it's uh, maybe in Romans where it talks about how Sarah still called Abraham Lord, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you, so I, y'all who y'all got to look it up because I don't know I exactly know where it is, but yeah. she, but but because he asked her to lie and mm-hmm. and be dishonest, you know, and she even though that was a bad decision, that's that was wrong, she did it, but she still was protected, mm-hmm. and their family came out blessed. So that's the point I'm trying to make. Like, mm-hmm. yes, I managed the finances, but there were many times where I had to submit, even though I ha- I have an econ degree, I'm a financial. I'm a freelance writer. I know I study finances all day. This is what I do. I'm at home scouring the internet for financial information. But then as a wife, when it's time to make financial decisions, I still have to defer to my head. So mm-hmm. that that happened a lot. And it was um, it was definitely a crucible, very refining moment for me. But I'm still glad I did. I don't, I don't regret anything that I ever did mm-hmm. in those situations. Amen to that. I, I I feel that because, and I tell people all the time that 
when the Bible talks about wisdom, it's always in the reference of, of the feminine. It's always she. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Oh, look at that. I didn't even yeah. think about that. Yeah. When you look at the book of Proverbs, it's always mm -hmm. she. Yeah. Know? She yells out on the streets. Wisdom, that kind of thing. So I always tell guys, you know, if you're going to marry a woman, make sure she's full of wisdom. Make Amen. Sure that's, that's good. Don't, don't just look at the outward, guys. Look at that's some right. other stuff. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. So going through a divorce, because I kind of want to switch gears a little bit. What did you learn? What was your biggest takeaway from your divorce? What did you learn from it? And what did it teach oh, you? Gosh. That's probably a whole nother book. <laughs> so... Well, we get an exclusive here. <laughs> So I, there's so, oh my goodness, where do I begin? The biggest thing that I learned, even though if I were to tell this story, anyone listening objective, objectively would be like, it, there would be a consensus. Everyone would be like, wow, you were in the right. He was in the wrong. That's just facts on facts, like, right? However, even though that is, what people would, you know, they, they would come away with the, the reality of the matter is I had a role to play. Like I can't blame anyone. I can't, I couldn't blame anyone, even though I was, I was, there was a lot of wrong, bad things done to me. I was justified in how I felt and some of the things that I did because they were objectively, you know, the, the courts agreed, the criminal justice system agreed, everyone agreed that, you know, I was done wrong. However, I still had to say to myself, what was it in me that did it that got to this situation? And that was really a hard thing because I would... I mean, probably for the first six months, I'm calling everybody like, yeah, what he did and this and this, you know, I'm telling you, cause you want to feel justified when you get done wrong, you want to be justified. You want to show how right you are and how wrong the other person is or was or whatever. And that's just human nature, but that's not God's plan for you. His plan is for you to learn, for you to be accountable, for you to take responsibility. So I had to, in the midst of this, even though, again, people, you know, lawyers, justice, everyone agreed that I was a victim. I still had to rise beyond that and be like, why, why did I allow this to happen to me? Why, what was, where was my mindset that I could go through a 17 year marriage, pretty much clueless and just be like, oh, you know. And so I had to come to, I had to come to terms with that, which was really, that was really difficult. Cause I'm like, no, I don't want to look at what I, what's wrong with me. I want to look at what's wrong with the other person, but growth doesn't come out of that. So I think that was one of the biggest takeaways for me there, but there's so many others. I mean, gosh, that's such a, it's a book probably, but I don't know. Maybe everyone goes through this. And so I don't know how interesting of a book it would be, but it was really a life-changing experience for me. I'm really sad that it happened. I literally thought I was going to be in my 90s celebrating my whatever anniversary, 70, 60. I, don't, I can't do the math that quick, but I never had any intention. I never brought up divorce. I never thought it would be my story ever. Like I would even say like, I'm like, divorce is so expensive. We'll never get divorced. I'm like, you know, get a girlfriend, do what you got to do. We ain't, we ain't getting divorced. We got to sleep with guns and knives. We're not get that was my, you know, that's what I would say. And it just, just didn't go that way. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. Cause I was married for 15 years before I went through a divorce. So I get it. Uh, but I will say something that I, I feel like I've healed faster because I was able to hold myself accountable and where I went wrong. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I, do, I believe that you can heal faster when you say, this is why I went wrong. When you can sit in, in what you've done wrong. Yeah. 
And I, you know, I, I always tell people I'm always public about the things that I've done, like for me, because I'm, I'm married at 24. So I was young, but yeah, I was the same age. Yeah. Oh, oh OK. Yeah. So you feel me. So I I mean, I was insecure. I had childhood trauma that I didn't address that mm. it just bled all over the family. You know, yeah. and I thought I was doing good at the time. But looking back, I was like, yeah, I see why I went wrong. I see why I could have handled that better. And of course, it takes yeah. two. But at the same time, like you said, there's a part that you play in it, too. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was more like, how did I get into this situation when I went, when I was actually married? Of course, I was not p perfect, but I was I was very dutiful and I did what I had to do, but almost to a fault, you know, to the point where I never, I was honestly just so content being a wife and mother that I didn't notice the things that were going on around me. But again, I if I knew then what I know now, I should not have entered into that situation. And for, so for me, it was more issue of just asking the right questions and vetting and discerning, you know, where somebody's headspace is. I learned that. And I didn't, I didn't know this, but when I was dating before I got married, you know, I tell guys like, I don't want to date around. I want, I want to be married. And it, all the guys would be like, no, I don't want that. And so the one person who was like, yeah, I want to be married. I, I was like, oh, okay. And to me, that was, I was like, hey, that let's do this. And that's what we proceeded to do. But you need a little bit more, um, you got to do a little bit more digging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because people's, some people's idea of, of marriage is, is different and, you know, all those things. So for me, it was more like just entering in the situation, but Honestly, I can say that God really shielded me that I wasn't in a 17 year battle, you know, calling people woman to woman. And I, I wasn't, I didn't have any of that. It was, I honestly truly love being a wife and mother. And maybe about a few months before I filed divorce, I was like, hey, what's going on? And I said, oh, this is what's going on. Okay. All right, you got you got like three months, and you, you know, and I'll observe you and see. And so I just had a really short period of time. It wasn't like seventeen years of struggle and fighting, and so I'm very thankful for that. I was kind of like seventeen years oblivious. Yeah. <laughs> well, fifteen because we separated um at year fifteen, and then the the divorce took two years. Um. So I, I'm still. You know, people are like, oh, you you wasted all that time with one person. And, you know, you're, I'm not going to say how old I am, but people kind of like, oh, 20, how sad, you, you know. Yeah, I'm 20, 25, something like that, 25, <laughs> 26, something like that. Um, but people kind of, you know, I've heard people like they attempt to pity me like, oh, what a shame you didn't. But I don't, I still don't regret that time. I really enjoyed I feel like what I was doing, I was doing unto the Lord and I would do it again under different circumstances, you know, in a, in a healthy situation. But I think God really just blessed me in that, that I wasn't like some women who were like, they've been fighting for 20, 30 years, you know, and I, you know, sleep in the separate bedrooms and all that. I didn't have any of that. I had a relatively, what I perceived was a good experience and until mostly did. Mm -hmm. I respect that. Thanks for your honesty. I appreciate that. Let's kind of switch gears because I wanted to ask you about this. According to USA Today, each American out household carries an average of $7,951 in credit card debt. Why do you think so many people struggle with credit card debt? And I ask you this because I'm sure that you were pretty good with finances before credit cards, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So why do you think so many people struggle with the, with the credit cards by today's standards? So, it's, so I, again, full transparency, I actually have credit card debt because I, in order to get out of my divorce, I just walked away from everything and whatever credit card debt was in my name, I just accepted because I really wanted to be done and I was trying to incentivize 
you know, the, the process being ex expedited. So I do have credit card debt. And I'll tell you what happened in my case. I just made a gamble and, and lost the credit card debt that I had was from, we had some rental properties. And so what we would do, we did short-term rentals. So we would furnish them. And then after a few months of rental income, you know, just pay off the credit cards. And it always worked. We never had any issue. But then in the middle of a cycle, that's when the divorce started. And we, you know, there was not any communication really as soon as the divorce started. We had some legal things like we, we I did have to, how do I say this? I mean, just to be honest, like restraining order and all that stuff came into play. So we just didn't have any communication. And, you know, there was some, there was some bad blood too, because not, you know, you file for divorce, but everybody don't want to get divorced. <laughs> so as, as a result, there was just, um, you know, since there wasn't a connection, the only other way to affect me was financially. So, you know, I just, I didn't, we the the business plan we had in place that always worked for us did not continue so for me it was a it was like a business continuity thing mm -hmm. so i still have some of that credit card now that credit card debt now and i think what happens with people is they maybe they use it credit card debt responsibly at first but then when you ha come into a situation where things change some somebody gets disabled they get ill uh medical issues divorce other type of trauma, maybe something traumatic happens, a natural disaster. So I think that I, I mean, could you, when you're using credit cards, you're kind of playing with fire. You're making a gamble that you're going to always be able to have that income coming in. And, and so I think that's, that's the issue. And then some people just are living beyond their means. They are, you know, they have so much going on people with, you know, kids and sports and activities and vacations and, Debt is very easy to access here in the United States. So it's easy, to, very easy to live beyond your means and play musical chairs until, you know, and then when the music stops, you're, you're left holding the bag. So before I would say I had a very, I was a very, I don't want to say judgmental, but I was very hard nosed when it came to like credit cards, debt, and you're, I, I don't think I was not that nice about it. And now that I'm in the situation that I'm in where I'm digging myself back out of debt, you know, I have a little bit more compassion and I, I can see why it happens. There's no excuse. And I'm, I'm actively, actually, I'm, I'm about to start working with a financial coach myself mm -hmm. because for, for me, I mean, it, it was like such a hard blow for me because I had basically built my life vision career around this idea of financial stability and independence. And I literally blinked my eyes and it was all gone. Like everything, like here I am a stay at home mom and I had helped build up the 401k. I had, I should have got a pension. I should have got, you know, the, the rental property, I, all these things that should have happened. And it was just every, the rug was like literally pulled from up under me. And I had developed this mindset at one point, like, wow, I did all that stuff. I did the bread, the, the, the spreadsheets. I did the budget. I did all the things and look at what still happened. And so that, that mentality affected me for a while where I was honestly, you know, I, again, transparency, I even, developed like a little bit of a spending, <laughs> spending addiction, you know, when I was first going through the divorce, because I was trying to, I mean, I was going through so much emotional, like turmoil. I was even like, you know, I had issues with safety and things like that, that I had to think about. And then I was, I had to start caring for my mom full time. And then with the COVID, I had some family members, you know, we had fallouts from that. So just like everything like came down on me and I'm like, uh, you know, I'm trying to manage all of this pain and I, I don't want to become a drinker. I don't want to be a weed head. You know, I don't, don't want to do crack. Definitely don't want to do that. Um, I don't want to become promiscuous. I don't want to you know, do gamble. So, you know, I'm trying not to eat my feelings. So the only way I 
figured out for a while to channel that was, you know, I was spending some money. Mm -hmm. So that happened to me as well. And again, not justifying, but I have like a lot more compassion and see how people can just go through emotional things. And you just have this cocktail, like this perfect storm of everything that just can happen. And it could just put you in a a bad place financially. However, I will say that even in all that, I am so incredibly blessed. I still came out of it. I, I'm about to buy my, buy my third property in, in three years. I was able to save, you know, like five figures, you know, high five figures in money. So I... You know, I'm having this credit card debt, but I'm I'm saving a lot of money. I'm I'm um, acquiring assets, so you know it's it's not all bad. But I yeah. still have some cleanup and stuff to do. So yeah, credit card debt is is definitely bad. It's a tool. I've used it as a tool in the past. Well, I mean, we've used zero percent interest offers to literally like rehab bathrooms and furnished places. So it's you know install ACs you know, no fees, no interest. So it can be a tool, but you just have to know what you're doing. And then, you know, have some savings or something. If some if something happens and you can't pay that that bill, I go back and forth. Am I going to get to the place where I'm like, because at one point we were like, no credit cards, never, ever, ever, never. So um, we did that for a while. And then we started using them and we were, again, very responsible. But the, I, you know, what happened with the divorce that kind of threw me, threw me off track. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not decided what I'm going to do right now. My goal is just to pay down some, you know, all the debt that I have and then just keep, you know, charging forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that because uh, I was telling my wife the other day, I'm 12 years older than my wife. So okay. I, was tell- I was telling her, <laughs> I said, there was a time when you had this thing called layaway and you couldn't get the stuff until it was paid. <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually not a bad idea. They need to bring that back more. That's uh, better yeah, than credit cards. Yeah, right. And I like what you said about credit cards that sometimes you're like gambling with your future because you never know what can happen because you rack up yeah. these these credit card debt and then something happened, but you already kind of pay for your uh your excitement in advance. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so, you're already you're already out there, so you're already mm-hmm. out there, bad, exposed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have a, a couple other questions to ask you because th- this has really been good. From pen- from seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? Nothing. <laughs> I'm not gonna. Say, I think that's actually that was one of the biggest issues. My parents got divorced when I was like nine, and they never really had any contact or any conversations or anything. And, and I'm in that situation now. I was married for 17 years and have z- almost zero contact with the person I was married to. And I, I knew I met him when I was 11 years old. So I've known him longer than I haven't known him. And we can only speak through like a court ordered app. Mm-hmm. We don't see each other. We don't talk. And I, and it's not because of me, but I'm trying to be delicate because I don't want to tell somebody else's of story. Course. I just no, want to tell yeah. my story. Yeah. Um. But, you know, you have to, basically the name of the game is you got to protect yourself. If someone can't, you know, operate in a way that's going to honor you or even communicate effectively, you just have to, you know, just protect yourself. And again, the, the courts were in agreement and that's what that's what the court ordered. So that's how we communicate. But even that was very, you know, very rare. So with my parents' relationship, my dad got remarried um, almost, you know, very quickly after my parents' divorce because they had been years not getting along. And I didn't really, no one ever sat me down and was like, this is how you figure out a man. This is how you bet a man. This is how, because they didn't know. My mom didn't know. Her mom didn't know. Her Mm -hmm. mom's mom didn't know. So nobody ever sat down and had this conversation with me. I'm just going to put my screen here. Nobody ever sat down and had this conversation with me. And I don't have enough memories from my parents' marriage to know 
anything about what that would look like. Mm -hmm. So I just, I didn't have anything to go off of like the Cosby show. That's, yeah, you know, and that wasn't in depth. That was just entertainment. So I literally was like, you know, the person I was married to, his parents were married for a long time, but they had a very tumultuous relationship. And so he would just tell me, you know, my parents are married. I know. So it was, listen, I got this and I'd be like, okay. Mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, so I don't really have anything. Unfortunately that I think that's why I got into the situation I was in, Mm -hmm. but I am, I am determined to break that. I talk to my girls all the time. They're like, oh, every time I'm like, okay. Now say for example, a guy wants to block and they're like, oh no, (laughs) you know, we're like role playing. And I'm like, oh, look at that guy. This is how you can discern. You can tell, look at his body language towards that girl. We do that all the time. And they're like, no. (laughs) (laughs) That's cool. (laughs) Yeah. So they, they, they have a different experience too. Like, yeah, that, that's what I'll say. That's what I'll say for yeah. that. Oh, for sure. What is the biggest mistake you see women make in relationships? I would say number one is either not having standards or not having the right standards. So mm-hmm. being on, on Twitter, you know, you creep into these different pockets and corners of Twitter. So when you get into red pill manuscript mm-hmm. on Twitter, they're all like, oh, she wants is a six figure, six pack, six foot. All the, and I think that to me, that doesn't do it. You know, for I've been approached by people, by men with money. Oh, come on, we'll, we'll, let's go to Cancun. Let's go to Europe or Italy. None of that, that doesn't excite me. What is your, do you have morals? Do you have a prayer life? Does anybody at your church know you? <laughs> what does your pastor say about you? That that stuff does not excite me. Six feet, but you a beater and a cheater. That, you know, that, so I think women, you know, the mistake is you are, you may, maybe you have standards of what are they really superficial standards? Are they, are, is it just about looks, money, you know, what he has? And then, you know, say you have the right standards, you you have to, you have to wait around till you find someone that meets the standards. And that's the hardest part as someone who is, you know, dating and waiting, that has just been the biggest thing for me. It's like, I have these standards and you, there's that temptation, you know, when you feel lonely, you're like, well, this would go out for a nice dinner or just do something. But, you know, time is winding down. Jesus is coming back soon. You know, we can't be really playing around. You know, you, so, you know, women have standards that are superficial or they don't stick to them. They settle when they shouldn't. Mm. That's what I think. Mm. Yeah, because or, sometimes. Or they don't have standards. They don't have standards. Sorry to cut you off, but just I want to go back. When I was dating, I had very you stand I didn't know that I was supposed to have standards of what they should be so mm. yeah and, and that happens a lot and and I tell people a lot of times that if you want a certain man or you have these certain standards in this pie chart if you want a man that's six feet you have to look at the average height of men in America <laughs> you know if they if the average height is only five eight then that's really going to cut that pie significantly. <laughs> so you have to kind of like wait around and, and are you willing to wait? I want a man that make $100,000 a year. Okay, well, statistically, you know, so you have to kind of pick and choose. Do you have the patience of Job or are you just going to kind of just jump in there and, and take your chances? So, you know, and that's what well, men I, I, I believe through God, all things are possible. Um, yes. So... You know, even statistically, but I, I think there's just so, I think the, the issue is, yes, are these things really available? We, who, but, but, but for me, it's more like, is six feet more important than him not being a liar? Mm. You know, but I, but you know what? I, I believe God can do all that. If you want six feet, six figures, six pack, man of God, 
put it, put it, you know, believe God. I'm the kind of person where if, you know, if you want the house with seven bedrooms and three bathrooms and a $2 down payment with God, all things are possible, but make sure your faith is in alignment with that. Cause some people, they want seven bedroom house, you know, but they got two bedroom house faith. So be it unto you according to your faith, but also make sure that what you're asking for makes sense for what you want to accomplish in life. Like six feet. Okay, great. That I'm, I'm short. So I, that's not like a big thing for me, but I guess some women who, if you're taller, I understand you need a taller man, but again, is that the main thing here? You know, prioritize these standards and have some give and take, I, mm -hmm. I would say. I agree. Yeah, because sometimes, yeah, that's a whole other episode. I want to be respectful. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I have one last question. Is it easier, and this is no right or wrong answer, so it just depends on your vantage point. Is it easier to love yourself or love someone else? Oh, let me think. Let me go back to the Bible. Mm -hmm. I think human nature is to love yourself. That's the fallen human nature to put number one first. Mm -hmm. But if you make a decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you will be empowered with a supernatural, super nature, a supernatural inclination to put others first because and then that's just really the message of the gospel and the cross right jesus could have put himself first he didn't have to do anything that he did but he went to the cross and it was difficult to the point of sweating blood and and he did it so i think if you're in if you're in a fallen state yeah num number one is going to be yourself but if you give your life over to god and let Jesus be your Lord and Savior. He'll show you. The Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And he'll show you how to do that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Great answer. I always ask that question at the end of every show. <laughs> That's a good question. It's a good question. It's definitely something to think about and ponder. Yes, for sure. Well, this has been a phenomenal episode. Thank you so much, Azra, for taking time out of your day to be a guest on the Scary to be Mary Brave Arts community, make sure that you hit the subscribe button. Make sure that you share this video with someone. If you are listening via podcast, make sure that you leave a rating and review. By doing so, it leaves you in a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Make sure you leave that rating and review. I would appreciate that. And also, let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. So right now, I'm just mainly on social media. So I'm on Twitter at Increase Laws. My handle is Increase Laws. And then on Instagram, my handle is Principles of Increase. Okay. Well, Brave Hearts community, you heard it here. This has been a phenomenal episode, episode 500. So I'm excited about this. Thanks again for taking some time to be a guest. This is Sean Heineman with special guest. Oh. Should <laughs> yes. I say my name? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly. for you. This is where you say your name. <laughs> Okay, say it now. This is Sean Heineman with special guest. Aisha McClanahan. <laughs> All right, Brave Arts community, take care.